All right, thank you all very, very much. Um, so what we are going to be diving into now are some talks from the community. Um, we have a poster session after this. So the, these are gonna be lightning talks, which means they're gonna be short and sweet and hopefully just kind of capture the highlights of the technologies that are going to be presented in uh, by some of the presenters in the poster session. So um, we've highlighted a few and um, because we have to kind of move through this quickly, each speaker will have um, two minutes total. At 90 seconds, um, there will be a red border around your slide to let you know that you've got 30 seconds left. And Andrea Harmon um, will be keeping time for you and we'll let you know when those two minutes are up, we hop on to the next person. So the idea is to keep this short, sweet, high level and get people excited about the different things that are gonna be presented at the poster session. And then we'll move into Gather Town to talk in more detail about these. So there will be no uh, questions for this session. Andrea, are you ready to get it going? We are ready. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and share. So I will call on each of our lightning talk panelists as we go forward. I apologize in advance if I get anybody's name incorrect. As I call on you, please do go ahead and unmute your audio and visual, and then we'll be able to hear you give your presentation. First up, we have Kevin Cannon from the Colorado School of Mind. Kevin, are you ready to go? Yep, can you hear me? I can hear you great. And your time begins now. Great. So the lunar regolith, of course, is a, is a granular material, but it has really unique properties compared to most materials we're familiar with and to a lot of the lunar simulants uh, as well. And specific, specifically, the lunar regolith has a really high cohesiveness, and that's manifested in a steep angle of repose and a very poor flow ability. So if you put lunar regolith into a funnel, it actually won't flow out of that funnel. Um, and to some extent, the, the size distribution is important, but it's really the grain shapes and specifically the agglutinates that are controlling a lot of this behavior. Uh, so in this poster uh, that we're describing some work uh, done jointly between Colorado School of Mines and Outward Technologies, where we're trying to work to characterize uh, some of those grain shapes and then also simulate them uh, using both computer modeling and then actual physical uh, simulants. Uh, so at CSM, we have a new capability to uh, make uh, combined size and shape uh, measurements of granular materials. Uh, so we can do shape parameters for hundreds of thousands of grains uh, in a single sample at one time. We have a request in for uh, actually making these measurements of real Apollo regular samples. Uh, and then our technologies, they've developed some really impressive physics-based models for looking at uh, regolith grains and grain shape and how those uh, particles would interact with different equipment, uh, for example, a wheel uh, or, or other construction equipment. And they've also developed these really nice uh, actual physical simulants of agglutinates that capture those, those unique branching shapes uh, that give rise to those properties. Uh, so we think, uh, you know, this is a really kind of uh, fundamental enabling capability, uh, understanding uh, these green shapes and being able to characterize them. And we think this has broad implications for ISRU, excavation, construction, and dust mitigation. So if you're interested in these, some of these capabilities uh, or want to get some samples measured, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Thank you. Excellent job, Kevin. Next up, we have Douglas Cortez from New Mexico State University. Douglas, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Fantastic, sir. Your time begins now. The reduced lunar gravity poses a tremendous challenge to accessing its subsurface. On Earth, conventional underground exploration methods rely on heavy surface equipment to provide the anchoring forces necessary to overcome the ground penetrating resistance. These technologies are impractical to transport to the moon, and miniaturized versions of them will have very limited depth range. Nature has been developing alternative lightweight solutions to this problem over billions of years. The earthworm, for instance, only weighs a few grams and is able to borrow down to two meters. With funding from the Center for Bio-Inspired and Bio-Mediated Geotechnics and the New Mexico Space Grant Consortium, my research team at New Mexico State University is developing bio-inspired tools and robots for low-gravity environments. The earthworm anterior end is more muscular and able to transmit larger forces into the ground. Instead of mimicking the entire worm, we focus on capturing the effect of its head. We retrofitted a miniature cone penetrometer with a flexible membrane and a hydraulic system to actuate it. 
The device is able to reproduce the warm expansion and contraction movements against the ground while monitoring depth and penetration resistance. The Earthworm Inspire Con was deployed on a bed of LMS1, Lunar Regolith Simulant, to assess the potential benefits of a bio-inspired penetration strategy. The device is driven into the simulant and stopped once the membrane is buried 10 centimeters in. At this depth, the membrane is inflated and deflated. After deflation, the probe is driven farther into the simulant to a preset depth, and the inflation-deflation sequence is repeated. The test results show a decrease in penetration resistance compared to conventional driving. The drop is a function of the inflation volume and the depth interval, which indicates that the process is adaptable and can be optimized. Our results show that airborne inspired penetration can eliminate almost 70% of the surface mass necessary to drive the probe 25 centimeters into the simulant and cut the penetration energy by a quarter while also limiting the peak power demand to just under 10 watts. Excellent, thank you so much, Doug. Okay. Next up, we have Ron Creel, a retired Apollo lunar roving vehicle veteran. Thanks so much for joining us, Ron. Are you ready to go? Yes. Can you see my picture? Uh, let's say, I, I like to talk to you. I'm a, as she said, I'm a Apollo lunar rover veteran. I work, I work thermal control. Today, I and my co-authors, Dave Cadigan at Moonport, Moonprint Solutions and Mark Cohen at Space Co-op will share four truths about lunar dust exposure on previous Apollo moon, moon exploration missions. And we will make recommendations to protect astronauts and their vital suits on Artemis missions on the moon, i.e. what can and should be done. In the first quadrant up in the left, upper left-hand side, that expresses the modes in which lunar dust can be generated and, and get on the crew suits and science equipment. In the right side, uh, on the right side, upper right side, this expresses the astronauts themselves expressing what problems they had. I want you to first off notice that we had a warning with the Apollo crew, 12 crew that they noted some type of throwaway garment for use on the lunar surface may be necessary. I've also calculated, we take, I've taken a two minute video on Apollo 16 from the TV camera that was on board and, and calculated based upon the cost of the Apollo program, that's equivalent to $82 million, which was wasted in that housekeeping effort. And the lower left-hand side is the primary thing I like to focus on this. I do not believe that earth-based dust testing simulation and removal testing is, is reliable and it's not representative of the moon environment. We had uh, actually the people at Manned Spacecraft Center, it's now called Johnson Space Center, had actually done thermal vacuum testing using Apollo 12 soil. And they found that they could brush off the, the dust and restore the solar absorptance, near, or, near original solar absorptance. This brushing did not work on the moon as shown. We are, we are rep recommending three isolation technologies, I call it the ABCs, to, re to leave the dust outside, outside of the, the habitat and outside of the, the astronauts' lungs. A, a is uh, flexible, uh, small reusable uh, suits, followed by airlocks and suit ports. Noticing Mark Cohen's 1989 Ames patent, which showed all of that operation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ron. Next up, we have Horatio Dragnia of the Aerospace Cor Corporation. Horatio, are you ready to go? I am ready, Andrea. Fantastic, your time begins now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Horatio Dragnia. I'm with the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with us, we're an FFRDC committed exclusively to the space enterprise. And today I'll be talking about our uh, idea to consider orbiting mirrors for lunar surface power delivery. Um, I wanna introduce the team quickly. So uh, Chelsea Tangavelu is our astrodynamics expert. Uh, Chelsea Applegate has uh, worked on both the optical system and optical surfaces. And Henry Hilvagen has made contributions throughout the whole project. Um, so we, uh, with this project, demonstrated feasibility of a concept of beam power transmission to the lunar surface using large orbital mirrors. Uh, and we looked at this through the astrodynamics, optics, and vehicle perspectives. Uh, there's nothing on the vehicle on this chart, but there is some in our poster, which I invite you all to stop by and gather down after this. Um, the application that we, well, we had multiple applications in mind, uh, but the one we, we stuck with for this presentation is the lunar spotlight. So uh, for this, we're just looking to use the mirrors 
to illuminate the lunar surface during the two week night. Um, the uh, solution that we'll be showing in the poster in a bit more detail. And again, we're happy to discuss some of our other options uh, if you come by and ask us, uh, is a two layer constellation. As you can see on the bottom left, that's kind of a representative figure. We have detailed um, astrodynamics calculations to back it up, but it's basically as two layers, two different types of vehicles, uh, projection layer and a focusing layer. And on the bottom right, uh, I'm showing a sample of the optical analysis that was performed in ZMAX. Um, so with that, uh, thank you for, you. yeah, Go ahead. I'm done. Thank you. Please stop by our poster <laughs> and ask us questions. Thank you very much, Horatio. Sorry about that. Next up, we have Christine Edwards of Lockheed Martin. Christine, are you ready to go? Hello, yes. My name is Dr. Christine Edwards, the Deputy Exploration Architect at Lockheed Martin Space. My team develops architectures for future moon and Mars, mission, Mar Mars missions. And one of our investigations is into how the lunar surface power architecture can evolve through the Artemis missions. We assess potential growth in power and resource needs as the lunar economy grows and explore the modularity and adaptability of systems like Lockheed Martin's Lunar Vertical Solar Ray Technology or VSAT that can enable the growth of the lunar power infrastructure. Uh, the power architecture can be designed to adapt from supporting the initial phase of the Artemis program that emphasizes exploration and mobility to a um, phase of Artemis that emphasizes sustained presence and Mars mission support. For example, uh, initial power systems can provide supplemental power to mobile systems for exploration missions to various locations around the South Polar region, and then form part of the Artemis space after its site is selected and adapts to incorporate new technologies like power beaming into craters. Because this infrastructure is a key aspect in supporting a budding lunar economy, the power system solutions can both enable the Artemis missions and provide the basis for a lunar economy. Uh, they can grow in a modular fashion to provide power as a service to Artemis and uh, to commercial missions. So come see our poster to hear more. Marvelous, excellent job, thank you so much. Next up, we have presenting on behalf of Martin Elvis of the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard and Smithsonian, Amia Roth and Sephora Rupert. First up, we have Amia, who will be speaking for a minute. Your time starts now. Thank you. So in the paper on the left, we estimate the solar power that can be generated by placing tall towers on the peaks of eternal light. We looked at 36 average illumination maps ranging in elevation and percent illumination based on LR or Lola data to determine the total power available as a function of uh, time of day. Using Python scripts, we rotated each map to simulate the passage of time and at each one degree increment, we aggregated the total number of columns which represent the possible spots you could place towers that were not overshadowed by previously placed towers. Assuming average efficiency for present day silicon solar cells, we finally calculate average, minimum, and maximum solar power estimates for each map. We find that near-term realizable towers up to 20 meters tall provide a time average power of six megawatts at 90% illumination, but for taller one kilometer towers, a time average power of over five gigawatts can be realized at the same illumination. However, power variation based on lunar time of day ranges from a factor of 1.1 to three due to overshadowing. Um, capturing megawatts or gigawatts of power at the lunar poles means building towers that are pretty tall to support those solar panels. We focused on concrete towers because concrete may be made from lunar regolith, minimizing the materials transported from Earth. We modeled a circular hollow tower whose cross-section walls become exponentially thinner with height and optimized it to be stable against both compression and buckling. The result is that such towers can be scaled up to many kilometers. The problem here is that the tower, but the mass of the towers increases rapidly with height, so material availability will most likely be the limiting factor. To reach the one kilometer that Amir referenced earlier requires about a thousand metric tons of material. These results do not consider shell buckling, which requires finite element modeling. And another concern is um, the strength of the regoliths, the regolith these towers would be built upon. Um, there might be a risk of rim avalanches if they are built around the crater, as Rossadal suggests, but overall we find that kilometer scale concrete solar towers are theoretically feasible and definitely worth pursuing for further research. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent job. Next up, we have Marshall Eubanks of Space Initiatives, Inc. Marshall, are you ready to go? Good morning. Yes, I am ready to go. I'd like to talk today a little bit about moat lunar penetrators, which are shown on the slide here. These are small penetrators designed to hit the lunar surface up to 300 meters a second. They're 40 centimeters long, about five centimeters in diameter, and would weigh up to about one and a half kilograms. At, with those parameters, they would penetrate it something like one to two meters, we think. We've been, these have been undergoing ballistic testing. We've had the pleasure of firing these very large bullets into the lunar simulant that's fairly crude. We were very interested in working with other people who might have better simulant yards that we could work with. They didn't mind a ballistic cannon. This has been developed under Air Force, uh, at least starting with an Air Force contract in the Lawn Darts program. We regard these as precursors. They could go anywhere on the moon with uh, some sort of satellite, of course, for the relay from the far side. They could go anywhere on the moon and be deployed in the roughest terrain to see what's going on. This is a lunar uh, permanently shadowed region, but they could go in a skylight. They could go, well, wherever you want. Um, and simply by entering the surface, they will provide very good geotechnic information and can carry a wide variety of of uh, instruments as long as they're fairly small. They've gone through the space, as part of the lawn darts, they've gone through the Space Experiment Review Board. We've passed that. And supposedly we're on the list to be developed to, and sent to the, no, sorry, not to be developed, to be deployed on the moon. Um, so this has been a very interesting public-private, public partnership, uh, which is sort of very new to me. Uh, but uh, the other thing I'd like to talk about just briefly is Compass, that's VLBI, beacons for the moon. My feeling is, is that the VLBI, the lunar reference frame will eventually be determined by lunar ranger laser ranging, which exists, and VLBI beacons, which we are developing. And that just like for GPS on Earth, all lunar geodesy will eventually will de depend on these two measurement systems. And we've been working very hard to deploy that too. So thank you very much. Excellent job, Marshall. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Zachary Fitzgerald. Marshall, would you Hi. mind me turning off your video? Can you hear me and see me okay? I can indeed, Zach, and your time starts now. Great. Hi, morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to give a quick overview of our pneumatic sample collection te uh, technology uh, that we call PlanetVac. Um, PlanetVac is a technology that we're hoping can take the place of a lot of the more uh, traditional sample capture methods for uh, a lot of missions. Um, as a baseline, most missions are choosing to use robotic arms or scoops to get regolith from the ground to an analysis cup or a canister on a vehicle. Um, these arms in the past have been very versatile um, and they've done a lot of great work, um, but they come with a lot of extra baggage too. Um, they, they take a lot of power, uh, they have a lot of mass, um, they're generally pretty expensive, um, and they're limited in their reach and, and, and slow to operate. They, they normally take an operator in the loop um, uh, to control. PlanetVac is designed to mitigate a lot of these problems while still being applicable to a wide range of missions. Um, as the graphic shows, PlanetVac works by using compressed gas um, to loft material from the surface, um, push it up a transport tube, and then capture it using some sort of uh, uh, mission-tailored capture method. Um, as a baseline, the sampling head is located on, in, or as a replacement to the foot of the vehicle. And, uh, and uh, it's connected to a transport tube that can be routed uh, wherever a uh, sample is needed. Um, at the end is a small capture mechanism that collects the regolith in whatever container or cup is needed for analysis or sample return. Um, sampling occurs in just a matter of seconds, meaning that it doesn't require an operator in the loop and only needs a very brief power on period. Uh, the total system mass and data budget is also very minimal. Um, we'll have a poster in the, in the poster session. And if you have any questions, you can come talk to me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Excellent work. Next up, we have Angela Garcia of NASA JSC. Angela, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Your time starts now. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Angela Garcia. I work for Jacobs Technology at NASA Johnson Space Center. And I'm gonna be talking about a one-year dust mitigation testing campaign that we're about halfway through um, at the moment called the Dusty Project 
or the Dust Solution Testing Initiative, our goal is to increase the technology readiness level or TRL of commercial off the shelf or COTS technologies, uh, dust mitigation technologies by validating them in relevant environments uh, with relevant lunar regolith simulant. So uh, really we're using COTS technology to leverage terrestrial dust mitigation experiences where we can and evaluate their feasibility of application on future Artemis missions. So uh, we'll be testing technologies within three primary categories, uh, hard good surface coatings, uh, soft good surface coatings, and pliable cleaners. So we're defining pliable cleaners as like a cleaning gel or putty that can gently liberate and store surface contaminants by pressing uh, the cleaner into the material. Uh, so for the hard good surface coatings, uh, the substrates we're focusing on are optical surfaces and aluminum. For the soft goods, the substrates uh, we're focusing on for the coatings will be spacesuit materials and common soft goods found in pressurized habitats. And then for the pipe cleaners, uh, the substrates that we're gonna be testing the cleaners on will be a variety of hard and soft goods with various uh, shapes and textures. So um, if you wanna hear more about uh, how we're evaluating the performance of these technologies, what types of tests we're conducting, what facilities we're using and, and where, and what type of data we're collecting and all that good stuff, um, stop by the poster. And then more is to be said in the third and fourth quarter of the testing campaign about results and implications, but uh, happy to talk more at the poster. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much, Angela. Next up, we have James Head from Brown University. James, are you ready to go? Ready to go. Your time starts now. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm talking to you from the basis in, of my experience in the Apollo Lunar Exploration Program from Apollo 7 to 17 and, and trying to think about what the situation at the South Circumpolar region, particularly in terms of the bedrock geology, uh, means for essentially design reference missions and CONOPS and therefore into the technology we need. So basically, to put it in the words of Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, we're not in Kansas anymore at the South Pole region. In fact, we're deep into Munchkin land here because in fact, it's a completely different environment. Uh, it's a great environment because there's lots of things to learn, but I want to uh, point out that the South Circumpolar region you know, is away from the Apollo Luna zone and that has important scientific meanings, particularly relative to the South Pole Aiken Basin. So I just want to focus here in the few minutes that we have here just to talk about essentially uh, the last couple of uh, eight basic guidelines that are illustrated in more detail in the proposal in the uh, in the poster. <clears throat> so for landing site selection, pinpoint landing is really essential. Uh, secondly, um, indeed, the if we take a look at the Traverse design and mobility, there's a couple of major guidelines here due to the complexity of the geology and uh, the sample time uh, at individual stations will be very long and learning discovery intensive relative to Apollo. Thirdly, mobility will, of tens of kilometers, more than Apollo is really necessary, absolutely, and talk to me if you need help justifying that. Uh, the DRM uh, CONOPS uh, might think us, you know, essentially long radially oriented traverses with multiple widely spaced long uh, duration stations at which large quantities of rocks will be selected. We need unique sampling procedures with rakes and uh, essentially remote sensing and real-time data. We also need to think about mission operations in the broader sense. You know, basically here, uh, again, we're not in Kansas anymore. We're practicing for Mars. And indeed, we need to practice uh, the kind of thing where we're going to be um, having the That's astronaut your time, James. Have a lot of mobility. And so see the poster for more details. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Next up, we have Walter Houston of Workforce 2.0. Are you ready to go, Walter? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Your time starts now. Hi, my name is Walter Houston again, and uh, uh, my company is Workforce 2.0. We're a new startup, and we're focusing on something a bit different. We're looking at the human relation in terms of, of, of space exploration and now industrial development. Um, we've created a system to integrate uh, machines with human beings to train them on how to do mining, construction, um, and other industrial development activities in an extraterrestrial environment. Um, this, this process was developed 
not specifically for NASA. Um, it was developed for a larger industry 4.0 perspective. However, NASA fits in quite nicely as um, new technologies and, 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 and systems are being developed to, to explore the universe and the moon and other places. Are you all finished? I am actually. Um, we have a poster in the um, uh, gather section that we encourage you to explore and look at and forgive me. I'm a bit nervous. This is something very big for us. We're a startup and we're new to all of this and <laughs> I kind of lost it a bit, but trust me, um, do ask me some questions. I can explain further. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you and talking to you further in Gallatown. Thank you so much, Walter. Excellent job. Next up, we're going to have Kirst Kingsbury. Kirst, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Your time starts now. Thank you, Andrea. Hello, my name is Kirst, and I'm a fourth year undergraduate at the University of Arizona. I'm studying mining engineering with a focus on mineral processing along with a minor in planetary sciences. Developing new beneficiation techniques that differ from contemporary approaches is an imperative to sufficiently utilize the regular based resources of the lunar south pole. This would include the primary resource of water in the form of dirty ice, native metallic particles, of iron, titanium, and aluminum as a secondary resource, and elemental sulfur and thorium as a tertiary target that could be utilized in waterless concrete in a small-scale nuclear reactor, respectively. The initial step of comminution, or resizing, would be done by a high-voltage pulse disaggregation, as opposed to using conventional pressures used in terrestrial applications. This technique is far better suited for the ultrafine particles of the regolith, and would allow for greater liberation of the water ice from the siliceous regolith. This technique would also disturb far less lunar dust than a conventional pressure. The second step of separation would be done using a triboelectrically charged belt, as opposed to terrestrial techniques that utilize gravity and water. This is well suited to separating ice, silicate minerals, and metals, as all would have different surface charges due to solar wind bombardment. The final step of metallurgy could see the ultrafine metallic particles centered together via the powder metallurgy technique to develop parts for machine repair or infrastructure. Thank you. Excellent job, Kurt. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Milan Krupa of New Frontier Technology Group. Milan, are you ready to start? Yes. Thank you very much. Your time starts now. Hello, I'm Milan Krupa. I'm the CTO of New Frontier Technology Group, which is the multidisciplinary innovation company developing advanced solutions and domains of energy, propulsion, robotics, and clean tech. A broad spectrum of offerings are able to effectively address all the topics of interest to this consortium. The solutions share a common technological banner, which is distinctly unique in this field. This allows cross-application integration of virtually any mechanical and infrastructure system, enabling common modular architectures and interchangeability of components for reduced cost, servicing, and logistical footprint. The solutions are simple, robust, long-lived, scalable, easily manufacturable, and repairable in situ using low-level technologies and are inherently space environment resistant. This provides minimal downtime for efficient high-speed mining, refining, drilling, tunneling, and construction solutions, including high-performance, long-range lunar terrain and what I quote, air mobility vehicles. Our energy solutions promise to increase power output, specific power and specific energy between 300 to 500% for compact power generation and propulsion, allowing high yield operations despite geographic location or solar energy flux. We hope to demonstrate this in NASA's Break the Ice Challenge and are seeking team members, etc. One enabling technology is the printable high-efficiency torque dense 10-fold 
electric machine, uh, which is uniquely, which uniquely integrates with our torque dense frictionless gears, again, tenfold, to yield superior solutions. Thank you very much. Two minutes is not enough. <laughs> Thank you very much, Milan. Next up, we have Michael Morris of the Space Exploration Architecture LLC. Michael, can uh, you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? I can indeed. Um, your time starts now. Great. As members of NASA's MPAC team, today's the rapid fire highlights of our search project, the Lunar Lantern for ICON's Project Olympus. I put a few links in the chat for more info. The Lunar Lantern is our first design assignment for the moon was commissioned to spur and support ICON's 3D construction technology to print with lunar regolith. Grounded in research and polar precedent studies, the comprehensive project was developed along with TRL and ISRU mission timelines to include planning infrastructure and schematics for lunar landing pads, roadways, berms, storage shelters, along with class one, two, and three habitat designs. The Lunar Lantern exemplifies Search's human-centered approach to addressing a myriad of environmental factors on the moon, radiation, seismic activity, micrometeorites, dust mitigation, thermal loading, pressurization, printability, etc. Conceived as both a module and standalone structure, the Lunar Lantern offers three connection points for alternative egress, expansion, and variable terrains. Public and private activities for four astronauts are located on three levels, and the integrated fiber optic lighting system supports the diurnal rhythms of both human and plant life within. Three shuttered windows allow for views of the Earth and the lunar surface. Sorry. The structure is deployed by a telescoping inner core brought from Earth. The core's top bottom aluminum caps contain external cables that unfurl to post tension the one meter thick optimized printed walls. The habitat is cradled on pendulum base isolators on reduced foundation and is sheltered and shaded by an independent Whipple shield structure consisting of a 3D printed dia grid frames and replaceable shingles. With the sunflower landing pad, we were further explored factors of safety for the inhabitants by developing 3D printed vaults that are externally buttressed by loose regolith field fill to deflect and trap the super and subsonic dust ejecta created in landing and liftoff. Michael? Yes, Michael, the I'm design. afraid that's your time. Okay, please visit the poster. Thank you so much. Next up, we'll have Chris Morrison from USMC Tech. Chris, are you ready to go? Can you hear me? I can indeed. Excellent. Your time, your time starts now. So I want to tell a short story, which is that of radioisotopes. And radioisotopes have been used since the 1960s by NASA, um, specifically plutonium-238. But early on, they experimented with a lot of different radioisotopes. And many of those radioisotopes went on to be used in the medical industry and are heavily used in uh, watt scale and even kilowatt scale amounts. And NASA chose plutonium-238 because it is indeed one of the best isotopes out there. Um, when you look at long duration missions, it has an 87 year half-life, just great for things like Voyager. But let's look at the moon and our current commercial situation. And you know, surviving even one or two lunar nights is very enabling for many technologies. Uh, imagine getting 28 days or you know, even longer, 100 days um, using a simple technology. So there are alternative radioisotopes and these radioisotopes are much easier to produce and lower cost. Um, they do present challenges, you know, shorter half-life, many of them emit X-rays, but we are working to find lunar companies out there such as yourselves. You've done the calculations and you know how hard it is to survive the lunar night and, you know, God forbid, operate during the lunar night. Um, if you want to have a heat for a drill, or if you want to have x-rays for remote sensing, there's a lot of different applications for these radioisotopes. And we have a manufacturing method that's scalable and takes a lot of the innovations from the medical industry and brings them to bear. So what you see on the right side there is a lunar heater configuration, which is a 30 watt thermal technology that we are actually licensing right now with uh, one of the companies we're working with. So if you're interested in this technology, I'd encourage you to check out our poster and I promise I won't disappoint. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. Next up, we'll have Rob Mueller of NASA KSC. Rob, are you ready to go? Yes, thank you. At NASA Kennedy Space Center, we've been launching and landing space vehicles for 60 years and going strong. Uh, we've been working on developing designs and concepts for landing and launch pads on the Earth, Moon, Mars, and other locations since the mid-1990s. I'm in the Swamp Works Innovation Environment in the Granular Mechanics and Regular Operations Lab. And we have a talented team of people thinking about this all the time. And we've come up with over 35 ways of building a lunar landing and launch pad. But in this poster, we don't want to focus on the solutions. We want to focus on the trade study criteria. If you come to the poster, we do list some of the top concepts that we have, but we know that there are very many good ideas in other government agencies, other NASA centers, industry, academia. So we're not trying to impose a solution. You just saw a, a very good concept from an architectural firm, and we, we know there's a lot of creative and good ideas out there. So let's focus on how we can trade off these solutions once they get put on the table. First, we have to look at preparation staging phase. This is not trivial. Then we look at the construction phase, and then we look at the operations and maintenance phase, including even all the way to decommissioning. So th this is important. The, the number one thing, number one uh, column there, you see up mass of construction material and systems. It's really not viable to uh, transport thousands of tons of material to the moon. So we have to do, do this using local materials. So there's a long list of things we have to do to prepare for that. Then we have to do the construction. I want to focus on constructability. Many concepts have been put out there, but are they really feasible? Can they be constructed? That's what we'd like to uh, trade off here. And finally, in operations, uh, we need to have a, a good life cycle operation. It's all about the life cycle. And if, for the budgets, if you can have a good life cycle cost, then that solves the budget problem. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Rob. Next up, we have Michael Provenzano of Astrobotic. Michael, are you ready to go? I am. Yeah, thank you. And it's always tough to follow Rob's great presentations. Um, <laughs> thanks to Andrea and the LSIT, uh, LSIC team for coordinating this too. We appreciate it. Uh, so starting with, yeah, the problem is we're hearing a lot about how creating a sustainable power source and infrastructure on the moon is difficult, but a necessary task. Um, and AMPT is something that Astrobotic is delivering. It's Astrobotic Mobile Power Distribution System. And it's an end-to-end -end solution that we offer with our uh, newly developed uh, vertical solar array technology and our rovers and our wireless chargers and um, cabling solutions to distribute power to assets across the surface. So the value proposition of AMPT is that it's flexible. Uh, we can distribute power uh, using any of our rovers, uh, specifically our cube rovers, um, through cables that are tethered to our VSAT. And then we can hook those rovers up with wireless chargers and bring them out to different locations on the moon. And that would allow other assets to drive up next to them uh, and use them for distributed power for a variety of applications as we're seeing in the Watts on the Moon Challenge. Uh, these, uh, each of these units is a standalone system and they're dust tolerant. They're being developed uh, to be dust tolerant intentionally. Uh, wireless chargers, for example, which we're developing in partnership with Wibotic, um, they, they've been tested in eight different lunar simulants. You can actually see in one of the top left images there, our charger is um, working with Razor um, down in KSC and demonstrated that we could charge the whole system in, in a couple of hours. We offer those chargers in uh, 125 watt, 400 watt units. Um, and then we also have our cube rovers, which are different sizes. Uh, those chargers are 85% efficient. And then, uh, yeah, I guess maybe just to close out, all of these systems can be developed and, and flown on our Griffin uh, Lunar Lander and a medium-sized Clips Lander. And if you have any questions, feel free to come by our poster session. I'm happy to share more information. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michael. Next up, we have Vishnu Senajapali from Honeybee Robotics. Vishnu, are you ready to go? Yes. Excellent, your time starts now. Hi, um, on behalf of the, the Lister team at Honeybee Robotics to present the work that we've been working on for the past couple of years. So Lister is a uh, heat flow probe that can be robotically deployed to three meter length. 
Uh, and uh, we're actually trying to hit two objectives. First is being a science objective. We're trying to measure the heat flow from the interior of the moon. And we do that by uh, taking the, uh, the temperature and uh, regular conductivity measurements at a half a meter depth uh, up to three meters length. Um, it deploys a 6.35 millimeter diameter tubing uh, that is made out of stainless steel. Um, and, it, um, and it can deploy pretty uh, semi-autonomously. So the deployment mechanism, as you see on the top right, is uh, mounted to the uh, bottom of the, uh, the belly pan of the lander. Um, and uh, can penetrate uh, just directly downward. So uh, it, uh, lunar regolith is fairly uh, compact and is very hard to excavate. Um, however, Honeybee Robotics has developed a pneumatic drilling uh, mechanism uh, which uses gas to excavate this regolith so that we have two tanks uh, right on the deployment mechanism and we are able to flow this gas uh, down the tube uh, to drill. Um, so as this gas expands, we're able to excavate this regolith to the surface and uh, penetrate down. Uh, we have demonstrated this technology out in our lunar chambers uh, up to, uh, up to 2,000 uh, 2, millimeters, about two meters, uh, and have uh, even uh, demonstrated in rocky regular situations where we have uh, detected these obstacles uh, such as boulders or rocks and uh, recover from that immediately by doing a pecking-like motion. So Lister will be flying to the Mari Christian Basin on the Firefly Blue Bills Lunar Lander in 2023 um, under the Eclipse 19 b mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vishnu. Next up, we're going to have Mahak Sarang of the MIT Media Lab. Mahak, are you ready to go? Yeah. Hi there. All right. Can you hear me? We can indeed. Great. As we've heard today, the LSIC and the emergence of other convening bodies in the space industry represents the fact that there are numerous organizations and entities actively engaged this new emerging era of lunar exploration. The number of stakeholders on the lunar surface will only increase after the first flurry of missions this decade, and collaboration is going to be imperative as we engage in novel challenges across science, technology, policy, and business. The lunar open architecture that we are developing at the MIT Space Exploration Initiative, in partnership with our collaborators at the Open Lunar Foundation, is a dynamic, living, and open roadmap for lunar exploration, powered by an evolving database that captures and coalesces current and future visions for lunar exploration. Our goal is to coordinate and digitize the numerous roadmaps, decadal surveys, conference proceedings, SBIR solicitations, white papers, and myriad of resources produced by the space community in one place. With such a platform, we hope to drive insights into the remaining gaps, possible synergies, and open questions across technology, science, policy, and business that remain on the path towards sustainable lunar settlement. Not only could this serve as a knowledge management and discovery tool for researchers to discover other actors working on similar technologies or for commercial providers to identify potential use cases for new markets that may emerge in this lunar space, our goal is also to show that the, the progress that this community is making and make that progress tangible. Furthermore, as we look ahead to the challenges that remain for lunar exploration, we will need to expand and communicate beyond our own communities and tools such as lunar urban architecture could engage new actors and serve as key policy tool to show the impact of continued funding on critical programs on the future of a potential lunar settlement. We could show visually how technology developments drive capabilities, for example. We invite you to visit our website at loa.mit.edu for more information. We'll be releasing a new update to the website in the fall and are always looking for feedback. We've already engaged with a few members of the LSAC community to collaborate in this work. So I'd like to thank this community for being such a great resource already. And we are always happy to discuss with any other interested individuals. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Next up, we have Paul Van Toussaint of the Michigan Technological University. Paul, are you ready to go? Hang on one moment, folks, while we figure out what's going on. There we go. Paul, can you hear me? Yes, Andrea, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Thank you for your patience, everybody, and Paul, while we work through that. 
All right, thank you. Um, well, I'll keep it very short here. So this is just a quick overview of our uh, previously uh, selected Luster project. Um, it's uh, uh, going to do research on the percussive hot cone penetrometer combined with ground penetrating radar uh, to measure and determine the geotechnical as uh, properties of the lunar regolith down to one meter depth, as well as uh, the volatiles that are present uh, at 10 centimeter intervals. Uh, not just which volatiles, but also uh, how much. Uh, the, the key here is that we have a cone penetrometer that can vibratory uh, in a vibratory manner can go down to one meter depth, pause every 10 centimeter intervals, then we will heat it up. And then by measuring the thermal profiles of that uh, heating uh, process, we can identify not only which volatiles are present, but also uh, how much of it. Um, the poster that we have goes a little bit more in detail about the kind of things we want to do, uh, but one of the main uh, deliverables here, of course, is the hardware, but also uh, sort of the database of those uh, volatile thermal profiles uh, that, of course, will be measured and then uh, published. The poster is can be found in location F5, uh, and I'd be happy to explain uh, much more about that technology. And then, of course, uh, we have another poster about our uh, winning NASA Big ID Challenge uh, thing, which you can find in B3, and I'm willing to answer any questions about either one uh, of those topics. Uh, find us in Gattertown, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Next up, and finally, we have Stephen Indis presenting on behalf of Chris Zachney of Honeybee Robotics. Stephen, are you ready to go? I am. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, yes, my name is Stephen Indyke with Honeybee Robotics. Uh, Chris apologizes. He cannot be here today, but he does send his regards. Um, so Trident is an ice mining drill. It's been in development since 2005. Uh, two separate Trident drills are scheduled for launch to the moon in 2022 on the Prime 1 lander and in 2023 on the Viper rover. Uh, the drill is a rotary percussive design and it's designed to cut into cryogenic ice and icy soil. It captures sample in 10 centimeter uh, incremental bites uh, down to depth of one meter. Uh, this bite metho method minimizes the, the power and allows preservation of the sample stratigraphy. Uh, samples are placed on the lunar surface atop previous tailings as seen in the bottom of the slide from, uh, right to, from left to right, uh, then interrogated by the M solo and uh, nervous instruments. Uh, Trident also has temperature sensors at the drill bit and the head and can measure downhole temperatures and downhole thermal conductivity. Uh, both of these measurements are required for heat flow, heat flow properties. Uh, currently, Trident is being fabricated uh, at the Altadena, California uh, Honeybee Robotics Facility and should start testing in Q3 of this year. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you at the poster session. Thank you very much to all our poster presenters. That concludes the lightning talk portion of today. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, very, very much. Um, so what we are going to do now is move into Gather Town, where you can view all of these posters. Um, Andrea, do you have the link to post? That should be good. So I, I want to remind for everyone. Gather What's that? I'm sorry, for Gather Town, correct? Yes, please. So you will need to be registered to access Gather Town because it, it looks for your email address. Um, if you did not get onto the registration in time, um, we will have the posters available afterwards for people to view um, on the web. So, um, and most of them have the contact information for the presenters if you need to follow up with them after the fact. Sorry, pulling that up, just give me one more minute. No problem. And actually, if you have the link, you're all welcome to head over there. Um, for those who haven't been into Gather Town yet, it's kind of like a little video game where you can walk around and interact with the speakers and walk to the different posters. So it's a nice way to um, have some of those more unscripted uh, interactions that you might have if we were 
able to gather in person, which as we all know, sadly we can't right now. All right, the link is there. Um, hope to see you over there and hope that you have many exciting discussions about some of the, the great technologies and, um, and expertise that you heard about this morning on the panel. Thanks everyone. Oh, and we will reconvene at 2 p.m. in this session, 2 p.m. Eastern, and I guess that's 11 a.m. Pacific.